part of what I'm saying is there's a legacy in that. In 1991, 92, I don't remember exactly where it was, the executive of the Barbados been here for several years. And most of the people who ran the museum previously, they didn't like Sandra. The fact is that the Sandra was appointed. They didn't like the fact that she was a woman. And they didn't like the fact that um, Leslie Barr was a woman and was also a raven. And most of them migrated to the National Trust. And they went behind them. <laughs> and my argument about heritage is not just man-made buildings <coughs> and so on. And even if it is man-made buildings, the Chapel House is the most original piece of, of architecture. Because it is expandable like a railway train according to the amount of passengers it has, the amount of people are going through. And people never pay attention to the layout of tenantries which were very much an African village composition with sleeping inside the houses, a backyard probably enclosed for the privacy, but a lot of social activity took place in the compound. You'll see them a lot in the cities like, like, uh, like Gats Castle and so on, which still maintain a lot of those tenant, traditional tenantry uh, conditions. But the museum, and the point I raised that, that the National Trust was not only that the, 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 the stamp of authority which the National Trust was put on all the plantation houses and some of the townhouses. I don't know, to explain the Barbados townhouses to explain, to demonstrate that we want Dr. Gale's house at the corner of Strathclay and Barbados Hill. That's perhaps a good example. Two story house, but table and that um, scallop front uh, behind the veranda. Anyhow, Dr. Fraser bought into the idea and which is responsible for a lot of chat houses now in the Lara Court. But they just come down there as if the dog hope is. Right? But that's another, a terrible call, sorry. That's another story. And the, and the other point was bush medicine. There are a lot of ephemeral practices by Barbadian population that has been discarded and not considered part of our heritage. And you wouldn't believe that right now all the health stores and health foods are doing the same things that our older Barbadians used to be doing and recommending various of the bushes to be used in your daily routines. Tumbrick, or as people used to say, tumbrick, right? So, if you look, and, and one more point I want to make is this. There's always the question of who is entitled. That's my question. Who is entitled to share or to say, have say, development of our national area. And I say everyone. That there's a feeling that certain only certain people can define that. And I am by that. Only certain people can be the creative parts. Like I hear about cultural industries, but I know who the workers are in the, in the industries. I know who training the workers in that those industries. But what do you know? So you don't start when you're a big man, they always start as a little child on something and encouragement and so on and so on. And I always remember BCL Brigade, which started as Frame Food Brigade in the 1920s. Frame Food was a was a uh, an additive to food and bad nutrition that we had, it became very popular and used to sponsor cricket, which evolved into the Barbados Cricket League. And Barbados Cricket League used to play for any piece of raw ground all over the country, including the Empire Telling Batsman, he coming up the hill now, get ready, he's coming. <laughs> All right, what is he coming, right? That's the type of ground stuff we put on. And the BCA. And if you notice, the peak of Barbados representation is when they had 10 men in the rest of the East team by 1966, 55, 66. 
anastic independence between plural and double. Okay, so who is in Tiger Man saying everybody? So this would include Blanchet. Blanchet. We're going to go through some details about it. So I'm going to ask Akin Tunde in my first time to read you the, an article that I wrote for Identities, which appeared in 1997 or thereabouts. Akin Tunde. Ahoy, the land ship on the reef. It was 1865 and William Barclay was 11 years old when he wanted to leave going home. He had heard the stories from the time he was a little boy and he was looking forward to it. As a matter of fact, little Willie was glad when his mother and grandmother joined a new group in Siemens Village in Brittany's Hill that used to dance the bone drum and dress up pretty. He was looking forward to joining the Cornwall. Willie never went on a boat yet. The closest he came to one was a maple he used to paddle by. He used to hear all the old men talk and the schooners and all the different places they made. But he was still frightened to get in the Moses that was going to take him over to Greenwich in the big boat in Carl Bay. All his dreams were dressing up for the parade of Carl. It was replaced by a tingling expectation, like a phrase was nibbling at the toes. There were 365 people that day in 1865 that left Barbados for Liberia on the break of Corey. And the parade that William wanted to be in still went ahead. And so the Barbados Nation movement was born in the heart of Britain's Hill, in a place known as Seaman's Village, with the participants mocking English sailors. Barbados was a forlorn place for African people. Slavery was, was supposed to be done, but the conditions and reality didn't change much and did not change for a hundred years after emancipation. Villages were crowded. Houses were roofed with cane trash. Hard ground dirt, the floor. Mattresses, if they existed, were made with cuscus or sour grass. Houses were for sleeping. They found out around compounds in African villages, which they were. Cooking was outdoors at the back, social gatherings at the front, in the road, on the common ground. Work began when light cracked the night and ended when the task was done. Sometimes the sun loitered to meet the moon, forcing duppies into trees where storytellers bent wires to hook them up for nosy children. Life was not nice. It was unrelentingly hard and unvaried, static and routine. Only a few children escaped the confines of this plantation team, finding innocent relief in the schools of the church and its beliefs. Into his life came the landship with its uniforms, its regalia, its ranks and its dance. An organization with its meetings and the meeting turns of savings its common purpose of mutual assistance, of discipline, of respect, and authority. The Barbados landship developed into a crucible of cultural expression, a repository of traditional dances combined to depict the fortunes and misfortunes of mythical British naval vessels at sea. Most people were therefore only exposed to the public aspects of the landship, the maneuvers consisting of the dance routines, ritualizing everything from engine room to rough seas and man overboard. But the landship offered much more to a community bound by the vestiges of slavery. In the world of the village, a landship captain or commander was tantamount to being a village chief. This community leadership role was recognized by the courts, which often assigned wayward boys to their care rather than impose a custodial sentence. Membership in the landship required discipline while offering prestige. Members learned cooperation and would travel all over the island to meet and socialize with other groups. The movement brought a cohesion to an otherwise amorphous set of communities. There was such a sense of racial oneness 
that in the 1910s, when Marcus Garvey and the Universal Negro Improvement Association was active, the nurses section of the landship adopted the Black Star symbol of the Garvey movement as its insignia. From then on, they became known as stars and wore black stars on their shoulders. Beijers have had long practice in cutting and contriving in order to survive. To retain access to, the, to their traditional music, Africans adopted the acceptable military drums and formed the top band. 